I also made the case for owning Bitcoin, the quintessence of scarcity premium. Scarcity premium. It's literally the only large tradable asset in the world that has a known fixed maximum supply by its design. The total quantity of Bitcoins cannot exceed 21 million. Bitcoin is the hardest money that has ever been invented. If you don't have my private key, you cannot spend my Bitcoin, period. And this is the power of Bitcoin. This is the power of Bitcoin. This is the first time we figured out how to create true property that you can take possession of with full custodial rights. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Talking in Bits and Oscar Mary, my good friend. Uh, it's been a long time, a little bit way too long since the last time you were on Talking in Bits, but I'm super happy to have you back, man. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, it's great to be here, Jose. And yeah, it has been a while since the first time I came on. So yeah, really happy to chat again. Yeah, as I was just saying, had a co-host at the time. Things have changed. Talking in bits has changed, but so has Fountain. And hopefully we can get deeper into that, but so has podcasting as a whole. Uh, and I want to get into that. But um, for the people that didn't listen to the last conversation, Oscar, and if you haven't, you should definitely go check it out. Go back to the catalog and check it out. Can you just update new time listeners on who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So my name's Oscar Merry. I'm the CEO of Fountain Podcast. Fountain fundamentally is a podcast app. It does everything you'd expect a podcast app to do. Search for podcasts, build up your library of shows and episodes and listen to podcasts, of course. Um, the two um, differentiators about Fountain are number one, you can support your favorite um, shows directly from the player. You can stream sats per minute, or you can send a one-off payment with a message, which is called a boost. Um, you can also create clips and all of the content within Fountain is propagated out through our social graph so that you can see um, what your followers are listening to, um, who they're boosting, what clips they're creating. Um, so we think it's a, a much better podcast listening experience in that sense. And yeah, we've been going just under 18 months and yeah, things are going well. So happy to talk about any aspect of Fountain. Yeah, things are going incredibly well. I mean, just to name a few things, you know, the activity feed revamp, which is more recent, um, being having uh, bank deposit rails, which we can get into that. That's that's definitely different. Um, the Zebedee uh, uh, involvement. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Just the whole payment infrastructure and how that stuff works. Um, but let's start off with just your favorite change over, let's just say since the last time we spoke, which is actually a big amount of time. Yeah. Great question. What's my favorite change? I think the activity feed is probably my favorite because what it does is, um, give you a window into what content other people that you follow are finding valuable. And, you know, it's one thing seeing a retweet on Twitter or a share on another social media platform. But when you see in your feed, one of those large boosts, you know, maybe a hundred thousand sats, 200,000 sats, 500,000 sats, even, which we had quite a few of those this week. Yeah. Um, you know, it really provides a strong signal that, okay, that content is worth listening to. And because, um, you can actually, um, take a number of different actions directly from the feed. So you can queue the episode up, you can add it to your library, you can play it directly from the feed. And so that's the feature that I'm um, most excited about. Obviously, it's still a V1, but I think it's going to be a great way for people to explore new sh new shows and new episodes that they don't necessarily have a fundamental enough interest in to go and follow or to go yeah. and you know listen weekly. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's a one-off episode that they might really enjoy. So I, I like the fact that the activity feed and what we're doing more generally is helping people expand out into different shows, different content, uh, different interest areas than they might not otherwise have come across. So yeah, really excited about that. And then, yeah, I think the Zebedee piece we can touch on as well, because that's really important for uh, in terms of scaling uh, in the future. Yeah, before we get to the Zebedee one, I also want to, um, the activity, uh, well, the, the question I'm going to get to, and I'll give it to you ahead of time, so maybe you could think about it quickly, um, is, is basically, how do things end up there? Meaning, what's chosen? Is it like a, a certain ratio, uh, back and forth? But before I let you answer that, I actually, as a content creator side of, of the activity feed, what I really find useful to, uh, about it, um, not only as a consumer podcast and the ways you stated, is, is that now as a content creator, I see two things. I see what's working in the space. 
right? Like that, I could go now, check that clip or check that episode out, like you just said, and say, oh, wow, this is worthy of 500,000 sats or whatever it may be. Uh, and the other part of that is, is it's a, it's a reminder that value for value is still working. Right? Like I actually sit back and see like, oh shit, oh, that just got 500,000 sats. This is a thing. People are not running away from this. It's actually getting more and more common. Would you agree or disagree? I know I just asked you another question, but. Yeah, 100%. We need reminding about value for value uh, constantly um, because it's it's new. You know, it, it doesn't really exist on other media platforms on the internet. It's very new and we haven't built up habits around value for value yet you know i'm sure you know a lot of fountain users have started to build that habit in terms of leaving their streaming sats on for every episode uh, sending a boost regularly when they hear something they really like but most people you know number one it's a brand new concept and number two it takes time to build that habit so 100 percent, we need those reminders that okay this is a thing and and when you see somebody else sending a large boost, you're not just, you know, thinking about that particular piece of content or, or the message that goes along with it, but you're reminded of, oh, yeah, it feels really good to support my favorite content creator. Um, and, oh, yeah, I, you know, I was reading one the other day um, because it was um, the Linux Unplugged's 500th episode. And there were yes. so many massive boosts saying, you know, I've been listening to this show for four years, you know every week i've got so much value from it um so yeah we definitely need to and this is something we've been trying to do within fountain the past year is surfacing the interactions between listeners and hosts through value for value and also listeners and other listeners as well i think the more we can make that part of the product showcase it and you know demonstrate to people that yeah it is working the better because yeah value for value is still so new and yeah it's got a long way to go yeah, I would like to back to reprogramming our behavior. Um, yeah, I, I think we need to lean more towards reminding people that they already pay for shit they don't use anyways. Yeah. Um, as opposed to the constant streaming side of things, because I think there's that unit bias still there too. Like if you see, let's, I don't know the rough numbers now, but 2,000 sets, right? Like realistically, that's like 20 cents, right? But if we see 2,000 attached to it, we kind of have this like, Mm, that might be a lot that I'm, I don't know if it's valuable enough. So I think we need to just start telling people, you know, first of all, you're paying 20 cents in that example. But, you know, you're already, you're already paying for that Spotify subscription. You're already paying for that nonsense. Um, so that, that's my thoughts on reprogramming people. Exactly. Yeah. And we've thought about, um, I mean, we do actually plan to have a global setting in the app that lets you just switch all of the um amounts to your local currency and we mm. we've thought about should that be the default um obviously we love bitcoin we're bitcoiners we want the default to be sats but i think there is something to be said to having at least the option to display your local currency so you remove that unit bias but again the, the other reason why we need the examples and the case studies and and the the baller boost being in the activity feed because it always is the top boost for the last um, I think it's three days is will will be in everybody's feed. Um, so that's a reminder of, okay, maybe your lo- last boost was 2000 sats, but you know, here's someone sending 500,000, here's someone sending a million, here's someone sending 250,000. So that's, that's what the true, uh, value of these episodes is. Who coined baller boost? Is that you? Uh, no, that was, um, <laughs> it must've been, it must have been Adam Curry, I reckon, or either Adam Curry or Dave Jones. Yeah, it came from uh, the podcasting 2.0 show. So, yeah, they've got a great um, jingle about it as well. Yeah, I admittedly and publicly have not kept up with Adam and all his doings um, just because I've been busy, not because I don't love Adam. I think Adam is a pioneer, of course, and serving us so much great content and so much you know, great structure over Valley for Valley. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I just I didn't know it came from them. Cool. Uh, that's a good a good, I guess, point to segue into the original question, which is how does stuff end up on the, on the activity feed? What's the requirements for something to be highlighted? Yeah, so there's kind of three sources of content in the activity feed today. Um, obviously, it's just a V1, but the main um, source of content is just who you follow. So if I follow you on Fountain, if you send a boost or if you like a comment or like a clip or reply to a comment, um, I will see that in my feed. 
Um, then we have the the baller boost for the last three days. And then we also have um, popular clips as well, because again, we think the clips are such a great way to, um, you know, for you to sample content or, yeah. you know, learn something in an area that you're not necessarily interested in um, that, that might take you down a kind of a content rabbit hole. And those are, those popular clips are done based on, you know, how many sats they're getting through the paid likes. Okay. And the, uh, is this, is that how it works um, for like the top 50, top 10 podcast or new episodes is just sat volume that determines? Yeah. So it's just the sat volume um, at the moment for our charts. Yeah, no, that's super great. That's um, free market deciding. Right, that's uh, I actually would be a little bit alarmed if you were like, well, you know, our team works really hard on our algorithm yeah. for selecting. <laughs> that's enough. Like, oh shit, Oscar, we're going the wrong way here, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and I think you do you do need some kind of. You can't just have the money signal if you're doing ranking or recommendations. You do yep. need other signals. Uh, the most important one is a trust signal. Um, so mm-hmm. that's why you know the content in your feed. Uh, primarily is from people that you follow because that provides that trust signal. But yeah, as we develop uh, ranking and recommendations, there will be, it'll be a combination of the value signal through Satoshi's and the trust signal based on, you know, who you follow and your reputation as well, based on the things you're doing in the app. Yeah, that that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Um, Let's segue into the just, I'm just going to coin this the payment infrastructure section, right? Like we could talk about Zebedee there. We could talk about bank deposits. Now, I'm just a big corner that'll go from whatever, my moon wallet anywhere straight into fountain. I have no reason to interact with definitely no bank deposits. Um, A little bit behind that decision. And then you can segue right into Zebedee and why that's major for the platform. Yeah, so it was incredibly important for us to have a fiat on ramp in the fountain app because... um, we, whilst we have incredible support and traction within the Bitcoin space, um, you know, and for many Bitcoiners, it's incredibly easy just to, you know, top up via Lightning. Um, we also have a large um, section of our users who are coming across Bitcoin for the first time, believe it or not. And they are looking to support their favorite shows. Um, and in order to do that, they need to purchase their first Bitcoin. Um, and so, you know, before we had the fiat on ramp in the app, which allows you to pay with Apple Pay and Google Pay as well. So it's mm. incredibly seamless. Um, before that, you know, our guide or our onboarding was quite extensive. It was, you know, go and download. Um, we recommended Blue Wallet um, and then top up using their in app purchase and then transfer over via the Lightning invoice. And, you know, for us, this seems simple, but for, for, your average person that doesn't know anything about Bitcoin or Lightning, all they want to do is support their favorite podcast. And one, once you start introducing all this terminology and all of these different components and you're asking them to go and download another app, it's, there's so much friction involved. So, um, yeah, that was incredibly important for us just so that a brand new user who hears about Fountain, hears about value for value on a podcast that they love can just get started all without leaving the app. Um, so yeah, it was really important for us, and we've seen a, a lot of um, payments coming through that um, fiat on ramp already. Obviously, there is the um, uh, sad situation of the light KYC that we have with the partner MoonPay, um, but there's just no way for us to to get around that at this point. I'm hopeful that more solutions will uh, start to come um, on board in in that sense. And yeah, so moving on to the second part of your question around Zebedee. You know, in order to have that uh, relationship with uh, MoonPay and have that fiat on ramp, we needed to have a uh, custodian um, because obviously Fountain is custodial right now. Uh, we needed to have a custodian that had the, the necessary uh, regulatory uh, steps in place to actually offer that. Uh, so that's why we, we've partnered with Zebedee for our infrastructure moving forward. And also that enables us to scale as well, because one of the things about streaming payments, especially when you have these shows with large numbers of slips is we are sending a lot of transactions, you know, every minute you could be sending, um, you know, eight different payments. And then you have, you know, hundreds of users doing that thousands of users doing that. The number of um, actual transactions that we're doing is is starting to really ramp up. So it's great to be partnering with Zebedee on that too. Now there's, 
it, so I take it because of um, you because of the Sebedee need and acqui- and partnership. I was going to say acquisition, but it's a partnership. Um, you were doing all that as a team yourselves before this, before Zebedee, like all the payment transactions, you were handling all that? Yeah, so we were using LNPay. Um, okay. yep. Big shout out to Tim from LNPay for helping us um, over the past year and a half. Um, it, LNPay was incredible and I definitely recommend anyone that's thinking of building um, an app or a service on top of Lightning, go and check out LNPay because it's an amazing service. Um, it was just, we just needed the regulatory clarity mm. around, you know, who's custodying the funds because, uh, you know, as a podcast app, we don't want to go and get a money transmitter license or yeah. something like that. It's crazy. So right. we want to find the right partner that can help us with that. And also because we offer the podcast, the wallet as well, it's not as if we have just a bunch of users with quite a small balance. Some of the podcasters can start um, having a significant balance in their wallet. So there's also that aspect of we want to make sure that we're custodying the podcasters' funds in the right way. Um, so that's, again, why it was important to, to partner with Zebedee. Yeah, and maybe this is more technical due to channels or whatever, but I have noticed uh, previously with Ellen Pay, um, if you were to withdraw your full balance, you'll actually end up negative sometimes, I'm assuming for fees. Uh, and now with, um, with Zebedee, it seems to leave about three to four sats in there to kind of not put you into the negative. Um, do you know anything about that? Or is, is, yeah, just... exactly. So that, that would be the the network fees. And also at the same time that we did this Zebedee yeah. uh, migration, we also completely revamped the entire payment infrastructure and mm. the APIs on our side as well. You know, the transaction data models, like all of that in the background was was redone. So I think what we have now that was launched in Fountain 0.6 in January is really kind of stable from um, yeah a data model standpoint, architecture standpoint, scale. Um, it's all there, and we feel comfortable that that's going to help. That's going to be there and help us scale as we you know expand value for value to more mainstream podcasting and outside of the Bitcoin space. Yeah. So does that? Um, I mean, I saw the benefits that it provides on the back end for you and your team. Um, does that also show in better app performance? Like, have you seen a significantly better app performance on transaction settlement and stuff like that? Or, Yeah, definitely. We still need to keep an eye on the liquidity because obviously sometimes we have new podcasters that are choosing to uh, host their own node and receive that way. So we still have to keep an eye on it. But yeah, I mean, it's night and day compared to last year um, with Fountain, with the Fountain app and also all of the infrastructure on the back end is, is much more performant, much faster. On the app side, we've made huge strides in, in battery performance, um, you know, data, all of that thing. So yeah, we're, we've had a lot of improvements over the last year and I'm happy with where we're at. Although having said that, we've still got so much more to do to improve the app. Yeah, I bet that's always the case. Yeah, I've noticed, <laughs> yeah. you know, as, you know, speaking to you earlier as an early, what I call an early adopter to today, the vast improvements, not only visually, right, what you've done with the UI and the whole rebranding and the whole redesign of the app. Uh, but I do remember the, and I'm sure you remember this because you got a lot of shit for it, uh, the, the heating of the phones while using Fountain. Like the phones is getting super hot. Yeah. I remember those days and I still would use Fountain regardless. I'm like, look, I love the experience so much. I'm willing to destroy my phone. <laughs> uh, and now that obviously is gone. It's been addressed uh, with so many new features. Um, I, I, that insight into the payment infrastructure was uh, big for me because as a, um, a what I call a doofy Bitcoiner, um, I'm just like, man, forget that. I'm just going to just load up sats like I normally do. And I don't care about bank ACH. But you're right. In order for this to scale to the most normie, uh, to the most people, you guys have to keep that in mind and 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 work on that. Um, a little, it might have been on purpose or not. So you said Fountain doesn't have uh, uh, it is basically a custody wallet right now. Are there any plans to do a non custody situation? Yeah, one hundred percent. I would love to have um, a, a non custodial option in the Fountain app. I'm really excited about what Breeze have released with their new um, SDK. They've basically mm-hmm. released an SDK built on top of Blockstream's Greenlight service, which enables um, building a non custodial Lightning wallet into an app where the node actually uh, sits on the cloud. The one thing that is kind of still stopping us at this point is the ability to receive payments offline. Because the way um, 
the Fountain app works is there's no distinction between a podcaster and a user. Any user on Fountain can receive from a podcast. And the reason we went this way is so that you can add guests, so you can add audience members to the splits. Um, and also, if you're a podcaster going on another show, um, you can just receive directly to your same Fountain wallet and uh, see the analytics next to it. So for that reason, we have a requirement that all Fountain user wallets need to be able to receive offline. You know, if you're on a plane, if you're asleep, your phone's switched off, you need to be able to receive offline, which is why um, it's part of the reason that we haven't done that non-custodial option right now. But I do know that there are things happening um, along those lines. So I'm confident that, you know, in the coming years, we will have the, the non-custodial option as well. Okay. Now, how are you handle? Because I know technically you go non, not technically, you can go non-custodial if you just plug in your own node as a split instead of, so how do you handle the situations where the node is down, um, considering that you want every, you know, transaction to go through? Yeah. So this is one of the things that we still have issues with sometimes because, um, and don't get me wrong, it works as a podcaster, you can run your own node. Um, there's a great, um, you can run um, an app on Umbrella called Helipad, which gives you the ability to read the boost messages and um, stuff like that. So it works. It's just, you know, if you have liquidity issues um, or if your internet goes down, that's when um, the payments can fail. Right now, what we do is we just display an error on the split in the transaction. Um, we are also working on the ability to retry individual splits for those cases where, you know, you send a large boost and, um, you know, all of them go through but one, for example. But yeah, we still have those issues every now and again. But mostly, um, I think for podcasters as well, um, the what we, I guess one of the biggest learnings of the past uh, just over a year has been that the part of the value of value for value is not the money. It's the connection between the listener and the host. It's the connection between the, the listeners and each other. Um, and so, you know, as a podcaster, you need to uh, see that. And so whether that's analytics on who's supporting the most or the ability in the Fountain Podcaster wallet to actually click through to um, the user that sent you that boost, see their profile, click out to their Twitter, you know, see what clips they've been creating. I think that's really important as well, which is why um, a lot of podcasters choose to to use our podcaster wallet. Yeah, yeah, I'm one of those. I, I actually, you know, love the wallet. I think it, it does what I need it to do. It does it well. Um, and it's also much easier to, you know, if somebody, because I've been doing a lot of uh, podcast production work, right? So like, it, it's one of those things where now, since I'm early on, what I consider early in value for value, part of my agreement for my retainers now is what I call an equity stake in the podcast and value for value. Now, the thing, the, this, the, I guess what I've encountered so far is, is that like this podcast that know what it is and it's like, oh yeah, that, that's absolutely fine. Just, you know, I'll plug it in for 5% or 10%. Um, but there's other ones that don't. And that allows me the opportunity to now onboard that podcast. And, you know, Fountain is obviously the easiest way to do that. Uh, but my whole point is, is it's much easier to add at deathbed to a, a, an equity split is what I call it. I know it's a value split, but I like, you know, I like to get my equity and stuff, you know, <laughs> um, instead of saying, Hey, here's my pub key, et cetera, et cetera. And my node being down and all that other stuff. So I, I do agree with custodial in this context. Yeah, exactly. And you know, what we, what we hear from, um, you know, podcasters is, is you, you can just withdraw, you know, you can just yeah. withdraw regularly as soon as your balance on fountain gets above, um, a certain level and that's what's so great about lightning you know you don't you can mix and match um it's fine to use a custodial service um as long as you just keep the balance low and make sure you're regular regularly uh withdrawing but that's amazing to hear that you're you know pushing value for value in that way i think that's the way that this grows is is you know podcaster to podcaster um listener to podcaster podcaster to listener back to podcaster so yeah it's great to hear yeah, I actually reached out to uh, Adam uh, Curry. Uh, I know it's Curry, but I call him Curry. Everybody gives me shit about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, he probably will give me shit about that when I talk to him. But uh, I reached out to him about that concept of it as well, where it's like, I'm sure he's heard it, maybe not. But yeah, I find, 
you know, obviously as a podcaster, I find what we all know value to value to be, which is I put value out, I get it back. Uh, but I, I never really thought about it till recently as the, I guess, business owner side of it. Whereas like now without contractual agreements or contracts or big lawyers and all that, I can easily, you know, get a piece of somebody's equity for the work that I put into their show. So there's a lot of podcasters that are basically, especially if they know about it, saying like, hey, how do you get this quality, Jose? Right. Like, how do you get the whatever? And I say, I can do that for you as a service. I do do it as a service. And then I introduce them to value, value for value. But this is going to sound very funny. Maybe not. I got the equity example from this thing I heard about Beyonce. Very weird. But Beyonce, Coachella reached out to Beyonce and said, I don't know the exact numbers, but hey, we're going to give you $15 million for an hour like to do a show. She said, keep your money. I want 25% equity and, and all of Coachella. Right? And then, you know, people where I grew up are like, no, take the money. Take the money and run. But she obviously something bigger, which is my value is that much that I can put my name on this, get some equity and return value in the long run. Um, so, yeah, man, I, I don't know if that's unique in the value for value space, but I've really made a you know, a good amount of sets and, a, and I've gotten a good amount of equity just using Fountain and Value for Value splits. That's amazing. Yeah. I think that is one of the first examples I've, I've heard of that. And it, it's so cool to see. Again, I think we're just scratching the surface of sure. what's possible with programmable money and this kind of like payment flow. Like the, the way what we have set up now is such a V1, a simple version. I also think the other thing that's interesting here, and it may be something that you can look at as well as well as well as helping on the production side is the education side because um you know there's it's one thing to claim your show on fountain and now you have a lightning wallet but there's so much more to the journey um mm. in terms of becoming successful um with value for value receiving a, a good amount of income and also just building that community with your audience um and i think for podcasters especially um, it's really, really helpful if they can kind of see case studies, see examples, like have someone to like really explain the options for them. Um, yeah, that's something we're trying to do more and more um, because we, we've seen a lot of success with po podcasters claiming their wallet, um, claiming their show. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about integrating the value for value ask into the show. That's when it really starts to work. Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're 100% on that. And uh, I believe on the education part. I'm glad to hear, it's actually going to segue into my next question, but glad to hear that you guys are exploring those options because um, I've done a few, uh, like Austin Bitcoin Club, a few panels, I, I wouldn't call them workshops, on uh, uh, on value for value uh, and how I onboarded and my experience, right? So I've flashed up on the, on the screen my fountain dashboard, uh, which basically shows how many sets I've made. And, and I just let people know, like this is one of those things where like, you see how many supporters, you see how many sets, right? Like this is value that's being given to me from the people. I also wanted to explore um, open sourcing the show, which is like, look, like now you can earn, you know, not only on Fountain, <laughs> but like you can actually be a part of the show and earn as well, which I know is not unique. But I think what I'm trying to say, and I know you understand because you're in it full time, is, is that we, we have so many different ways that we could tool this and we can use it. And it's, it's very fascinating. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. And I have to kind of like, <laughs> I have to control myself and say, no, <laughs> like get one step at a time. Let's get the simple stuff working, you know, but there is so much that we can do here. Yeah. For example, you, I think you, you touched on it, you hinted at it, but the idea of crowdsourcing a podcast is such an amazing idea because, you know, what it, what is a podcast? It's just you know, audio content, it's just people speaking about a particular topic. Um, and it's also the relationship between the host and the audience. But, you know, there's, there's no, you could easily have, you know, a community of people, you know, 20, 30, 50, that are all the hosts of the show. Yeah. And they all just come and drop in for an episode when they've, you know, either have something to, to share with the group or the wider audience, or they've discovered something new, or maybe something they've been working on for a while is there. And yeah, you have a steady 10% split that goes out to maybe, you know, the actual uh, business or the organization. And then whoever's involved in each episode just 
receives the splits that episode and it, it can just work like that. So I'm really excited yeah. once we get over this, um, you know, kind of version one of, of value for value, but there's still a lot more to do there. So we do have to be patient with it. Yeah, definitely, man. I agree with you. Um, how do you, how does Fountain, uh, I keep saying you, but you know what I mean, as a company, how do you guys, do you guys work on engaging um, podcast creators uh, and trying to source ideas from them uh, and trying to see how, you know, you can cater to them or help them out on their journey? And if you do, what ways have you taken to approach that? Yeah, it's a great question. We do. And we're trying to do that more and more this year as well. So one of the uh, things that we have as a kind of uh, first resource is our guide to value for value, which is on our website. It's kind of like a 10 step guide on how to be successful with value for value, how to integrate the ask into your show, some different format options that you can choose. And also some examples of other shows that are doing it it well and, and kind of how they, they do that. So that's like our resource number one. Um, the other thing that we do is um, just get on calls with podcasters and kind of just talk to them and find out like, you know, more about their show format, because I think the show format is so important to picking the right option with value for value. Like, I don't think you know, reading out the boosts at the start of the show necessarily works for some, but it works really, really well for others. So it depends mm. on your show format. And then the other thing that we're we're starting to do as well is partnering with the hosting companies because the hosting companies are paying attention to this. They are starting to add the podcasting 2.0 features to their uh, offering. And they are starting to have direct conversations with their with their podcasters, with their customers. So I think, you know, we obviously as Fountain have a lot of insight into what works and what doesn't and how to try and kind of get the flywheel of value for value working um, because it is a flywheel. Like part of the value is the audience interacting with the rest of the audience. And you don't get that until you have the, you know, the early adopter, maybe 10 users sending boosts each episode or something. Um, so yeah, working with the hosting companies is something that we are doing a lot more of, um, just in terms of co-education, but yeah, I'm always, uh, trying to speak to as many people as possible and, and learn what's working and what isn't as well. Yeah. Um, if I were to say, what, what would you think the big, the biggest hurdle, and you can answer this specifically for, uh, just a listener, um, or, uh, and, uh, as a podcast creator, but what's the biggest hurdle to start doing value for value. I mean, I think it before it may have been on ramps, right? like understanding mm -hmm. that, but like in your take, if I'm new to, you know, podcasting 2.0, I downloaded Fountain. Uh, what's the most difficult thing for me to understand? Yeah. So I think on the listener, we're getting there because Fountain, the app is much better than it was. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're almost there in feature parity with the, uh, the legacy podcast apps, as we like to call them. Um, and we have the on-ramp now, so it's really easy to get started if you know nothing about Bitcoin. The key challenge is podcasters onboarding. And I would say the most difficult aspect of this is deciding how to integrate the value for value segment into your show format. I think that's the most difficult thing because there's two types of podcasters. There are um, the kind of more established podcasters that have maybe done, you know, 100 episodes plus, maybe they have a producer helping them out. You know, they have their system established. They, they kind of almost have it on autopilot in terms of how they do the production. And so for that group, it's quite difficult for them to change their production process. You know, it's a big ask in terms of saying, hey, change this, switch, switch around the format because it's working for them. So, you know, to, for them to say, okay, now I'm going to change the ordering of the show such that we have this value for value segment at the beginning, you know, how do they do that? Do they experiment with one episode? Do they, you know, start at the end? And then, so it's a lot of cognitive work for the podcasters to figure out, okay, how do I bring this into the show? And that, as you know, is the most important thing. It doesn't work if you don't do that. Um, and then the other kind of group, it's actually easier for new podcasters because they can just start the show with it 
in the format um and so yeah that's that's definitely the biggest challenge um and you know if you think about other services that you might be able to easily sign up for like for example maybe podcast analytics or you know a service like that it's not it's not a big cognitive load to sign up you just sign up and you just you know click a few buttons and you're done whereas with value for value as a podcaster setting up your lightning wallet is one thing but yeah really thinking deeply about your show what's the purpose of your show um what's the structure of the content and the format of the content and what is value for value how does it fit in like these are quite deep things to think about as a podcaster and that's why it takes time um for that for them to go through that um journey i guess yeah so in europe for any podcasters that are listening new what define the value segment and i know adam yeah. did a lot of talk about this but go ahead in, in your your thoughts yeah so the value segment um is all about the value for value ask it's asking your audience to provide value back to you and it's really important and adam talks incredibly well about this so i'd really really encourage if there are any podcasters listening to find an interview with adam curry i can send you some to put in the show notes um but yeah he talks incredibly well about it but essentially you can't just ask people to support your show you can't just say hey guys if you like the show uh, support me on fountain um it needs to be more than that you need to actually explain what's happening with the value exchange you need to give examples you need to say hey guys like um i re- really hope you enjoy what we're doing here you know how many hours uh of how many hours have you listened to this show you know how much uh value have you received over the years of listening um we would love it if you could send that value back to us in the form of sats on on a podcasting 2.0 app like fountain um think about um the coffee you bought yesterday like you know just something as much as that so yeah you really have to um lay that out for users and i think one of the things that we've seen as being the most successful way to do this is just by reading the other boosts that users send because sometimes um it really clicks for um a listener when you hear another listener of the show explain um how much value they've received from it and that's again going back to the start of the conversation that's why we made the boosts um public in the app that's why we surface them in the activity feed because m- most people don't even realize how much value they get from podcasts they don't they just you know walk yeah. out the door in the morning they stick them on and they go to work and then they but it's actually when they stop to think about it it's incredibly impactful for them they have an incredibly close relationship with the host of the show and yeah sometimes it can take another listener another member of the audience to actually um articulate that before it clicks for them and they go yeah you're right that i i received that too so yeah very long-winded way of of explaining what the value segment is but it's just important as a podcaster to communicate that this system exists yeah i agree uh, the a big one that i got from adam i actually had the pleasure of meeting adam in person and watching him give a a uh, conversation about value for value, but the big one to me was the ask. Like I, I think as well, or two things. Let me say the ask, and the uh, something that may be not obvious to the listener, but it's uh, important is is the fact that we tend to define value for people, for ourselves. If that makes sense, All right? So like we set this threshold where it used to be this like, hey, donate ten dollars, five dollars, uh, but I got let's say five hundred dollars of value from you. So like, do you really want me to pay $10? If we just let them willingly decide what the value is that we determine, more often than not, people are going to show you that and they're going to pay that forward or whatever. Um, so I got those two things from him in person was always ask. Right? We got to make sure that we are actually asking for that support. Um, but the big part of like that whole aspect, that whole piece there is important to me, which is understand that your value is limitless to some people uh, and to other people it's worth a dollar, whatever. Yeah, Just yeah, moving. exactly. And I think the other thing that's um, 
useful to think about um, in terms of the value for value segment or ask is that, you know, you can talk about, you can ask your listeners for other um, types of value as well. Yeah. You know, it's not just the money. So you could ask for feedback on the show. Hey guys, send me a boost. Um, let us know what you thought of the last five episodes. You know, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? You know, your producers, as much as we are, like help us shape the direction of this show. Um, that's incredibly beneficial. Um, even just questions or comments about whatever the topic is, because then that turns into content mm -hmm. for the next episodes that people can use. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways to structure that segment, but the most important thing is just to have it in there and play around with it. Obviously for yeah, a podcaster that's established, it's, it's difficult for them to, to do that. Yeah. The, uh, this is a vast general question. You may know the answer. You may not, but like, are we still in that like gravitational pull where your podcast ha podcast has to be like Bitcoin ethos for you to see the value for value come in? Or if we've, kind of taken off stratosphere where a podcast that's not related to Bitcoin at all can still see some value. I think we've definitely um, branched out of the Bitcoin uh, nice. community and the Bitcoin space. Like if you look at our charts each week um, on, on fountain.fm, um, every week there's non-Bitcoin podcasts in the top 10. Um, I just think that because it takes time for the host to build it into their show, Obviously, the, a lot of the Bitcoin shows kind of have a head start there. Um, but yeah, ultimately, value for value and Bitcoin work so well together. Yeah. They're like a match made in heaven. But they are different things and they can coexist, um, you know, on their own. Like Adam's been doing value for value for years before yeah. Bitcoin, before the Lightning Network and before podcasting 2.0. So um, really, you know, the, the benefit that we see to the podcasting industry is is more is wider than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is yeah. just the tool that we use and it's hidden. Um, it's much more about the benefit to the podcaster, the benefit to the listener. Um, and yeah, it's much more about that. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I've actually gone into business deals um, since, you know, uh, doing value for value podcasting. Um, that actual term value for value now escapes Bitcoin. And I've actually gone into business decisions to good old fashioned, well, let me see what value I provide you. And then you just decide that value in return, right? Especially those dealings when like you want to work with somebody, but you don't really know what that number is, or you're both kind of like going back and forth on like, oh, well, you know, all right, well, listen, let me do the job. Let me show you what I can do, right? We've set no defined numbers. Let me show you the value. And then afterwards, you tell me what it ended up being for you. What value did you get from that? Um, and I, you know, in retrospect, every human being should know what value for value exchange is. But it wasn't until value for value model and podcasting that I actually extracted that and said, well, wait a minute. Like, you could do this in real life with other people and actually have better relationships with people than if you were just with a contract down with a number on it and then, you know, walk away. Yeah, yeah that's amazing to hear. Um, I think, yeah, as we said, it's, it is so new for, for a lot of people, but yeah. once you explain it and they get it, it's so obvious that it's a great way <laughs> of doing things. <laughs> yeah, it's like escaping, um, uh, escaping free out ways of doing business, right? Like the contracts, the lawyers, the money down, the, the, all that stuff. And I'm not saying it works for everybody. I mean, you know, you could end up doing like an eight hour job that you, you use value for value and the person comes back and says, well, here's a hundred bucks. <laughs> um, but more often than none, if we are to believe this to be true and it has shown us to be true, I think people will do the honest thing and, and they'll pay what the value was that was received. Um, we've talked, I think we talked about different types of content coming on Fountain the last time you were here. Um, I do know some musicians are dropping albums. So I do know that that's starting to take off. I wanted your thoughts on, or an update, I should say, on that scenario. Um, and maybe if you guys are thinking about supporting video in any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, we definitely have plans to add different content mediums. Um, I think we probably talked about this the last yeah. time uh, I was on, but I think what we realized was that we have to make sure we're delivering an incredible podcast listening experience before we start to branch out into these other areas because ultimately that's our bread and butter. And if we're going to help value for value go mainstream, then 
you know, we need to have an incredible app that has all of the features that the other apps have, um, looks incredible, has incredible UX and everything in terms of the payments, the social features um, is kind of really slick. So we're, that's our number one priority. Um, but we do definitely want to add new mediums. I think some of the things that should be coming soon are the first is the live uh, item from the podcasting 2.0 spec. So this one's relatively simple, actually. It will give podcasters that record live the ability to um, push that out into Fountain. People can listen on Fountain live. People can boost live. Um, and then the idea is that that will, when the live episode turns into a regular episode, all of the metadata around the boost and who's been supporting will kind of get maintained under the episode. Um, so we're really excited about that one. It should be coming in the next month or so. You, um, is that just audio or like live, yeah. just audio or okay? Um, so it will, de- it will be video. It will be video. Um, maybe not in the first version, but it, yeah, it will definitely be video as well. Amazing. Okay. Um, so yeah, live is a big one. And obviously, you know, most people listening, I'm sure they will have a show where they record live. So, um, everyone can see that. Um, and also it fits nicely still with, with podcasts and then separate to that. Yeah. Music's really exciting. We do have musicians, as you say, launching albums on fountain and receiving support. Obviously, you know, we need the player in fountain to be a bit different if we're going to properly support music. Um, but we do want to continue to, to do that as well. Uh, really excited what the Wavelet guys are doing um, in terms of helping musicians get set up. And yeah, video, we we do have plans. Like we do, I think we'll eventually support video. It's just about how many um, uh, hosting companies are, are offering that and how many podcasts are, podcasters are actually doing it as well. Um, and then the other one, I mean, that I would really like to add um, but it's it's probably not going to happen immediately is audiobooks as well, because mm. I'm a massive fan of audiobooks as well. And Otherwise. I think e- everything that we're doing in the Fountain app, whether that's value for value, whether that's clipping, whether that's all the social features that help you to discover great audio content, it works for audiobooks as well as podcasts. And actually, I think the discovery problem in audio, which, you know, I've talked a lot about for podcasting, it applies to audio books even more because just of the, the um, how much effort it is to actually go and listen to a full audio book. So yeah, lots of ideas around the different content mediums. Yeah, that'll be really fun. I think we spoke about audio books as well. Um, surprised nobody's come along and, do- and, and, and done that, but um, I'm more interested in, in when it comes to that battle, um, how do I put this in not the nicest way possible? But uh, getting rid of the publishing companies, man. Getting rid of the record labels. Getting rid because right now I would say you know Fountain can't do that because Universal Records owns the right to that song and you can't stream sats to something that's owned by Universal. But then the 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 light bulb that goes off there is is well, what about these artists that are doing everything on their own and are not signed to Universal, right? And are not they don't have to adhere to these. Uh, what I call buffoons, but these uh, higher conglomerates that control their likeness, their all that stuff. Uh, and I'm fascinating on just like Fountain was the railway or or the intro, I would say, to a lot of people to podcasting 2.0, just because it's simplicity and it's app. I would like that to be the same thing for creators to to own their own stuff, right? Where it's like, well, now I'm over here. You know, that beat is yours. That track is yours. The lyrics are yours. You don't have to pay anybody. You get full value and can do it on your own as opposed to you guys having to deal with regulatory stuff or, you know, copyright infringement stuff. If one of the big artists were to stream sets. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, I think the, the ideal world is that all just gets replaced with, you know, <laughs> value for value and, and streaming payments. Um, yeah, huge shout out to Wave Lake because they're doing some really cool stuff in this space and they're so focused on, on musicians as well. So excited to see, um, what they do. And the amazing thing about this as well is, um, you know, these, everything works together. The payment systems work together because we're all using lightning. We're built on open RSS. So the content's freely available in all these different apps. So as long as we continue to, um, yeah, build on open systems and work together rather than, you know, directly competing, then I think we will get there, not just in podcasting, but yeah, in all the mediums. 
music being yeah the biggest one. Yeah, and music. I think the big domino is um, title uh, and Dorsey and, and all that stuff with Jay Z and all that. Um, do you think that's you know in that same vein of competition? Do you think that's good for big established players to be able to pull something off? Uh, seeming seeming sorry, like a light switch right away, as opposed to you know folks such as yourself having to actually take the long haul and have to build up all the infrastructure and all that. How do you feel about that type of competition? Yeah, I think that Tidal specifically, Mm -hmm. um, I do think Tidal will add um, value for value streaming payments um, into their app at some point. Um, uh, You know, I've actually, you know, Jack has said that he's used Fountain to stream Sats the podcast. Um, You know, we were were going back and forth on, on Nostra about that. And so I'm sure he has plans to do that. It's just a question of when. And it's also, and probably the biggest factor is the, yeah, the relationships with the record labels. Um, I'm yeah. also confident though that, you know, we as Fountain can in, c- can compete against, you know, Tidal because, you know, they have a lot to do. Um, you know, they have this existing platform already. And also I think coming from podcasts, and then transitioning into the other mediums also gives us an advantage there. So, yeah, I would love for them to do that um, and ready to to compete with them. Yeah, no, that's I can see the argument both sides where it's like they're going to help mass adoption as well with just their yeah. fingerprint and their... Go ahead. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. for example, if, you know, if Tidal launched streaming payments to musicians and suddenly every Tidal user has a lightning wallet in Tidal and can seamlessly transfer back to Cash App, well, then they all know about lightning and they all know about value for value and they all know about streaming payments. So, you know, we can be there as Fountain to uh, support their podcast listening and, and other audio mediums as well. So I think, yeah, we would welcome it because it's it's an education. As we've talked about this, this entire conversation, it's an education piece that's the most important thing here. Absolutely, man. Um, uh, ad model, I mean, obviously as value for value enthusiasts, we understand the flaws of it. Do you think the, since we last spoke, do you think the ad model is bleeding out still, but it's just such so big of a behemoth that it'll take a while? Or do you think that they've innovated in certain arenas that they've actually gained some ground and people still value that ad model? Yeah, I think it's definitely... Um, losing ground. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody in the podcast industry is talking about how the ad uh, dollars are decreasing. Um, I do think that there will still be a place for certain kinds of advertising. Like, think about the difference between a well thought out host re- read ad and a dynamic ad insertion, you know, talking in a different voice, telling you about something that's completely unrelated. They are night and day in terms of um, the advertising experience. So I'm not somebody that says get rid of all advertising. I just think that if you can have value for value listener support along with more considered advertising like a, you know, because the reason you have to go to dynamic ads and kind of force as many ads into your show as possible is because there's no alternative. So if you have value for value and yeah, a considered partner that can sponsor your show, then I think that's probably ideal. Yeah. In your mind, uh, I'm I'm sure there's a few examples that do it, but in your mind, uh, is there a space for both? So for like a full value for value approach and an ad sponsored approach? Yeah, I think there is a space for both. Um, I would like to get to a world where it's just value for value, but also I think, you know, even if a podcaster is, you know, making enough for to, to live on purely through value for value, I don't think there's anything wrong with finding an incredible partner as a sponsor to come on and, and partner with the show. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And actually, sometimes the sponsors can provide value to the audience as well um, if it's related. So, yeah, I think that there's space for them to work together. Yeah, that's a good point. That's uh, most people. I, I say this a lot. Most people, I don't think understand not only the time, uh, you know, 
used up to be able to record a podcast, edit a podcast to get it one out. Uh, but the expenses of it, right? Like this isn't just obviously, you know, my computer. This is a setup that I have, an elaborate setup that makes all this look like this at the quality I want. That's my choice. I'm not putting that on the listener. Uh, but it is one of those things that like, uh, I think I heard McCormick talk about this a lot before. I was in an in-person uh, podcast with him. Um, and he was basically saying like, look, it takes me X amount of dollars to, to run my show. Right? It takes me, I got six, I forgot the numbers, but I got six people. You know, it cost me 100K a month to run this whole operation. And sorry, but value for value is not going to get that to me. And, you know, it's not going to get me 100K. Um, and although I was a little bit pissed off, I was like, he's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, an expensive operation he has going on there. But then he has one of the bigger Bitcoin podcasts in the space too. So um, just got a few more questions for you, Oscar. I know we're here uh, approaching the hour here, so I won't hold you up for too long. Um, what do you think podcasting goes next, man? Uh, and I've thought about this from, from everything, not only from creators, uh, but from an AI perspective, what, what we're seeing with these tools that are coming in. I mean, seamlessly, they're going to be able to edit a whole podcast for you on the fly. Like you wouldn't need to, you know, they're cleaning up sound for you. They're testing your gear for you with, it, with the Adobe releases. And the next one is, is, hey, just we'll put it together for you. Where, where do you think we go next with podcast? Yeah, so I actually think on the AI question, I think that podcasting uh, is and will more and more become the last bastion of true you know, content that you can connect with and believe that it's actually real coming from an actual human. Because, you know, we've seen what the AI tools can do in terms of generating text. Um, but there's something about the connection between the listener and the host of a podcast. Like, you, the listeners will not be fooled by an AI-generated voice uh, yeah. in podcasting. Um, the connection is is too deep. Um, and you you just the time the time input is is so large that you yeah you know exactly who that person is and and the tiniest you can probably tell if they're having a bad day based on their tone of voice sure um so yeah i think it, it shows even more the importance of the podcasting medium um i think on the other side i think for me the most exciting thing about podcasting is the discovery because you know, the, we still haven't fixed discovery in podcasting. It's still very difficult and very rare that you will discover new content uh, or a new show to, to listen to. And I just believe that, you know, it's such an amazing medium because the dead time that we have in our days is never going to go away. You're never going to have to not do the dishes or, you right. know, go on your commute or whatever it is, walk to the gym. Um, so I think those times it's amazing to fill with some of the content that's out there in the podcasting medium. Um, and I think discovery is, is the most important part there. So I'm interested to see, um, how some of these new AI tools can help on discovery, but I don't think it's ever going to replace the medium. Somewhere an engineer saying challenge accepted, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I heard, I, well, you're right. I, I think nuance is always there. Uh, but you heard that that Joe Rogan and uh, Steve Jobs AI one, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was that close. was good. That was good. That, it's yeah. pretty close, yeah. But I I also think that um, yeah, you'd still be able to tell. I mean, one thing is yeah, obviously our our clipping feature that works with the transcript. We had to put that behind the premium uh, version because it was costing us a lot to generate those transcripts. But obviously now with some of these open source. AI models, um, it's becoming a lot cheaper. So for us as a, just as a company, as a business, as developers of products, it's amazing because suddenly we have um, cheaper tools that enable us to offer something uh, to all of our users as opposed to just behind a premium um, user or to do it in a way where we have to worry about the cost less. So for example, if you've used the clipping tool on Fountain, you'll see that the transcript only runs on request. And that's because if you don't want to make a clip, we don't want to incur that cost of making the transcript. But if that cost goes to zero, then suddenly those transcripts can be instantly available. We can do all sorts of other things with them just to make the product experience better. So, I mean, yeah, the AI tools are incredible for empowering developers um, and product builders to, to make their products better. That's a really good point because I was thinking maybe that clipping feature now expands into like a um, 
you know, sort of like what YouTube Studio is for the videos, right? Where it's like this area where, you know, right now on Instagram and TikTok, the thing seems to be like that long caption-based flow clip of the show. So you insert the support for video, then guys like me are able to, you basically give me the tools to do what I'm already doing with inside of Fountain and then maybe hide that behind the premium and basically say, hey, Jose, you can now come load up talking a bit, cut some stuff out, have some cool um, captions that are, you know, in this little workflow um, and be able to just share that all with inside of Fountain. And, and I think that now becomes an opportunity where Jose is like, well, I'll pay for this premium support. Or, I mean, or for this premium service because now you've outsourced, you know, the Adobe suite. You've outsourced all this stuff that I use to kind of make all these clips and you built it inside, like you said, with the help of AI to lower that friction and cost for you guys on that end. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, so one question left about the team um, and is more of like a recap, but before that, is there anything you want to say specifically about Noster? I know you guys added Zaps. I've actually tied my fountain, uh, uh, my Noster and my fountain with my NPUB. Um, and I see that it's a way for me basically to use my fountain wallet over on Noster. Um, any thoughts on Noster as a whole or about just the Zaps implementation or your thought behind it? Yeah, so I definitely am really excited about Noster. Um, we added the NIT5 and NIT57, which is the Zaps feature, just as kind of an initial integration. Um, obviously, you know, I just think it's a no-brainer because as a podcaster or a content creator more broadly, um, whether you are, you want to see how much you're earning in the different places that users are discovering your content. So, you know, how much did I earn from Boost? How much did I earn from streaming sats? And how much did I earn from zaps when I actually shared the episode outside of the listening experience. So having uh, those payments in the same place and the analytics alongside it was a no brainer for us. And I think it's going to be really valuable for podcasters as well. Um, and then on Nostra more broadly, I think, you know, it's going to be, we, we have more plans to integrate with it. Um, the main thing that we are looking at it for is the ability to do cross app comments in the podcast space. Um, obviously podcasting is such a fragmented, um, media, uh, ecosystem because no one app has more than 30% share. Um, you, and you have, you know, a huge long tail of different apps as well. Um, cross app com comments is one of the goals of podcasting 2.0 such that if I comment in fountain, then somebody else looking at that episode in breeze can actually see my comment and ideally can reply to my comment as well, such that the conversation is not limited to these silos. Mm -hmm. So yeah, cross app comments is a massive goal of podcasting 2.0. And, you know, I think that Nostra could be a um, good candidate to look at to try and enable that. Um, so yeah, we're excited to continue to explore that. Um, and obviously the ability to pay um, along that protocol as well massively increases the value that you have there. So yeah, stay tuned. Lots more to come on the Nostra side. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any ideas, please reach out. Yeah, that's super bullish, man. I love, <laughs> I love hearing that. Um, awesome. So last question, Oscar, just to wrap up. I think it's been about a year or so um, since we last spoke or whatever. What have you learned about yourself and what have you learned about your team uh, and, and everything you guys have had to overcome uh, over the last year? Not to make it sound like it was all hard uh, or bad, but I know you guys have grown. What are some lessons you can share? Yeah, great question. Um, I think probably one of the biggest lessons and one of the things that I try to remember going forward as well, and also one of the things that's been hardest to do is it's really difficult to get the balance right between doing what are the, you know, basics and the important fundamentals of building a product, but also pushing the boundaries of what your product does and coming up with new ideas and, you know, essentially, uh, providing something new out there in the market. 
So for example, I mean, yeah, Fountain is a podcast app. So we have to build the best podcast app and it requires an incredible amount of work to actually, you know, build the underlying audio library, um, build the UI, design the UI, build the filtering mechanism, the podcast database in the app, all of the different parts. Uh, and they're the, that's the fundamentals. Um, and then the new stuff that we're doing around payments, the social features, the activity feed, uh, you know, the Nostra integration, the podcast, the wallet, that's like the new stuff. Um, and it's a constant uh, juggle between the two, you know, okay, this month or last month, we didn't focus enough, focus enough on, on new things. You know, we were just grinding out, you know, the podcast listening features, improving the battery performance, adding new features to the audio library. Um, so that's probably the hardest thing to do is, is getting that balance right. I would say the way to to probably keep yourself in check is just to speak to people as much as possible who are using the app. You know, everybody that sends in feedback, we uh, record all of it. And that's what we use to help us make the decisions in terms of, um, yeah, making sure that we're uh, addressing user feedback, fixing things, um, building out those fundamentals from the podcast app perspective, but then also you know, coming up with a few new, new things each month uh, to try and push the whole thing forward. So yeah, that's the biggest challenge. And, um, you know, week in, week out, we have to, we have to face it. Yeah. You guys are doing a stellar job. At least it looks so on the outside. It's all smooth sailing. I, I see you guys are in the, in the comment section addressing not only people's concerns, but, you know, showing people love. Uh, you guys have showed me a bunch of love before in the past too. So yeah, man, super excited for everything you got going on and the team got going on. And uh, I think you guys are the spearhead. I know there's a lot of podcasting 2.0 apps. I don't want to, you know, dismiss them. Uh, but my experience with Fountain since very early on to what it is today is night and day. And uh, it's all going up and towards the right. So kudos to you and the team, man. Um, Oscar, let the listeners know where they can find you, where they can find more information about Fountain. If you want a specific call to action for podcasters and uh, or the listeners, the stage is yours, good sir. Well, yeah, thanks so much for having me on again, Jose. I uh, would love to come back, you know, again in the future and have another debrief on on how value for value is going because I think, yeah, these conversations are so valuable. And I've loved watching uh, you as well in the space, experiment, teaching other podcasters and others about it. I've learned an incredible amount from you as well. So, um, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Um, yeah, for anyone listening that hasn't checked out Fountain, we're live on iOS and Android. You can go to fountain.fm to find all the information. And yeah, my one ask would just be, think about the content that you listen to, whether that's a podcast or it could be a, an audio book or it could even be a video. Think about the content you listen to. Um, how much value does it provide for you? And reach out to the podcast and say, hey, I'd love to support you. Um, here's, here's how you can get set up because this um way of doing things this value for value ethos is not going to be spread by me it's not going to be spread by me or fountain it's going to be spread by you listening right now and going and telling your podcaster your favorite shows about this so yeah go and tell your favorite podcast about value for value and lightning and let's push this thing forward <laughs> absolutely couldn't agree more guys you know where to check us out Fountain, I, I gotta be, yeah, I got Oscar here. I have to say Fountain every time, but I do say Fountain every time. Check us out on Fountain or any other value for value supported platforms out there. Um, the most important part is that you get away from the legacy outlets. You can check us out on Bitcoin TV uh, for this video content. Uh, hopefully, check out the video on Fountain soon. I don't want to put that on, put that on Oscar. But uh, either way, check it as check us out on the Bitcoin standard of media, whether it's Bitcoin TV for video, whether it's Fountain for audio, uh, and get away from the legacy outlets. Dump the Spotify, dump the YouTube, uh, and if you need help with any of that, reach out to me. And what, it goes without being said, probably reach out to Oscar as well to help you get set up. Uh, but appreciate y'all as always. Check us out next week. We've got a lot more content coming from y'all. Later.